on 27th April 1939, a series of six photographic exposures being taken at the Allegheny Observatory in Pennsylvania caught the star Groombridge 1830 brightening dramatically in four of the six exposures by up to 0.62 in magnitude. That only four of the six saw this means that whatever had happened had unfolded and finished in slightly over 18 minutes. This outburst had been captured entirely accidentally. Groombridge 1830 is a close star, just over 29 light years away, which gives it the effect of having the third largest proper motion in the sky from our perspective, which makes it useful for astrometric studies, which is why it was being photographed frequently. Incidentally, this star is very near naked eye visibility, just on the line of what the human eye can see in extremely dark sky conditions. And if anyone had known the star was going to do this and had been looking, it would have actually gone well into naked eye visibility during this brief period. Not bright, but in principle could have been seen. Over the years, a number of other stars were accidentally photographed showing this very odd, very transient brightening. And most were in fact otherwise completely normal, otherwise stable stars. This led to the suspicion that these stars were actually experiencing titanic explosions, releasing super flares many, many times greater than normal stellar flares. But it was very difficult to confirm this until the 2010s, because observations of them had, up until then, all been accidental. The telescopes happened to be looking in the right place at the right time to catch them, and systematic study wasn't possible because of how transient and totally unpredictable they were. These things are over and done with in minutes. However, confirmation of this phenomenon came with the Kepler spacecraft, which spent several years staring at the same spot in the sky, taking frequent brightness measurements of the stars within its field of view. You may recall that Kepler's light curves were how Tabby Star was discovered. But the fact is that space telescope was an absolute boon for discovering exoplanets, but also for scientists studying variable stars of all flavors, they could use the data, and those looking into stellar flares, and even sunspots on other stars. The flares showed as spikes in the light curve, and lo and behold, a number of super flares were caught by Kepler, nailing the phenomenon after all those decades. But the new information was actually somewhat disturbing. So the super flares release energy up to 10,000 times that of a normal solar flare. As is well known, solar flares and their somewhat related counterpart, coronal mass ejections, can do damage to human power grids and electronics if the circumstances are right. What's going on with the super flare is orders of magnitude worse than anything we've ever seen here. The Carrington event is a blip compared to this. But here's the kicker. Most of the stars doing the super flaring were generally stars that should be stable long term, and unfortunately includes the Sun's G2V class, meaning that the Sun in principle may be capable of occasionally producing a super flare. Now many of the flaring stars were younger than the Sun, and that might mean that this is mostly a phenomenon of young stars which later settle down. This is known to happen with red dwarfs that are flare stars themselves, but that's a bit different of a phenomenon. As they get older, they calm down. In fact, some of the super flare stars were observed to produce multiple super flares, almost like in a cluster. Yet some stars as old as the sun did exhibit super flares, meaning that it's still possible for an older star like the sun to do it. This opened up several rabbit holes, but the biggest was the question, has the sun ever done this before, and more ominously, could it ever do it again? Or just as importantly, if the sun didn't do this, then why? What makes it so calm for its class? And does that play into the question of the rare earth hypothesis, in that it may not be earth that's rare, but the unusual calmness of the sun? Can that change? And then the question, if the sun did this today, what would the effect be on us? The initial explanation was no, the sun cannot do this because one possible, at one point even probable, mechanism advanced was that it was related to planets in very close orbits to these stars, enough that the magnetic fields of both bodies are intertwined, 
driving the phenomenon by the magnetic fields winding up and snapping back as the objects rotate. A huge wrench was thrown in this hypothesis by Kepler, however, which found no transiting planets of this nature in orbit of any of these stars. Further searches in radio emissions that would be telltale of this kind of mechanism for flaring also showed no such signals, tearing the mystery open again. One commonality that has been found is that all superflare stars show brightness variations consistent with the presence of very large star spots, or groups of spots, some dimming the host star by as much as 8% when they rotated into Kepler's view, which sunspots are linked to solar storms here, though these were far bigger than anything the sun currently does. Also found using spectroscopy, there were clear indications of activity in the chromospheres of the stars that showed strong and extensive magnetic fields, which in short means that superflares are really just scaled up solar flares. The whole thing seems to point to strong magnetic fields, but that varies and doesn't preclude the sun from superflaring, either in the past or even in the future. It won't do it right now, but this led scientists to try to determine if there was evidence of the sun doing this in the past. The energy from an event like this would produce nitrate concentrations on Earth, and a natural place where this would accumulate is the polar ice, because particles from the sun get funneled to the magnetic poles, where they might be found in ice cores. Cores from Greenland going back to 1561 found nitrate variations, an interesting one that loosely, but not exactly, corresponds to the Carrington event of 1859. Other spikes were found. But the problem is that other events, such as massive wildfires, seem to also be able to produce these kinds of concentrations. Other cores did not see anything close to the time of Carrington at all, and it had to be concluded that ice cores are not good indicators of past solar activity. Another option was carbon-14, which could be produced by these kinds of events, and then be taken up by living things leaving a record. The obvious place to go with that are tree rings, looking for spikes that might indicate solar flare activity. Interestingly, over the last 3,000 years, three events were found where carbon-14 dramatically increased. Cores from Japanese cedar trees showed an increase of 1.2% in the year 774 AD. That's actually significantly higher than the sun's normal flaring produces in its cycle. This result was later confirmed by cores from multiple trees in different locations of different species. Something happened in 774. There were also studies regarding beryllium-10, which also formed in this way, but significantly harder to study. But an ice core from Antarctica did detect a rise in the 770s. Other studies have since shown more indicators of this event. But was it a superflare? Unfortunately, the data is such that it is not possible to definitively associate them with superflares. One odd thing, though, while whatever happened in 774 was marked, it would need to be 20 to 40 times more powerful than any observed solar flares. That's still not the thousands of times greater than normal flare level that superflares show. As an aside, 774 is within recorded history. So if that were a solar event, there should have been severe auroras visible all the way down to the equator. Records from China do seem to show this, as does an account of a red cross in the sky around 774, along with fire in the heavens reported in Germany. The Chinese records describe bands of white light spread like silk across the constellations, and I found that particularly interesting because I've seen strong auroras especially one event during the last geomagnetic storm, and a large part of it did appear like bands of white silk, but mixed with green and ruddy red areas. So it does not appear that the sun has recently produced a true superflare, though there may be other ways to try to determine if it had on a more long-term basis, such as looking at evidence from meteorites or the moon. But if the sun did produce a superflare today, with our civilization being present, what would happen? The answer is that one as strong as those seen in other stars would be so catastrophic that it might actually constitute an extinction event for some species, and would seriously damage the atmosphere. It wouldn't be quite as bad as a nearby gamma ray burst, but it would also basically damage and leave traces on much of the solar system. 
One thing to consider is the short-term luminosity increase. An event observed on the star S Fornassus briefly increased the star's luminosity by 20 times. And here there may be evidence for an event like that. Some lunar rock samples actually show a glaze on their surface where they appear to have slightly melted. One thing that would do this would be an increase in solar luminosity of about 100 times that held for about a minute and probably would have done that within the last 30,000 years if that actually happened. Another oddity would be Jupiter's moons would actually see local ice melting for a short time on their surfaces. It's also been suggested that early super flaring in the sun's history might explain the faint young sun paradox, and that the sun might have been dimmer back then, but Earth never froze because it was getting periodically baked by super flares. What we do have is an estimate on how commonly other stars super flare. Weaker superflares and sun-like stars happen on average once every 800 years, and for big ones it's once every 5,000 years, potentially more, that's subject to revision, and could be as high as 10,000 years. Also the sun's relatively slow rotation may play into why it's so quiet, which may be a saving grace, because that's not going to change dramatically. But there's also evidence suggesting that superflare stars in general do indeed change behavior and that superflaring is a product of a period in a star's life, rather than something it does throughout its life, or is episodic through a star's life. In short, the sun may be quiet now, but at some point in the future, it could go back to superflaring and high activity, or it could remain quiet indefinitely because of its rotation rate. Thanks for listening. I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently noticing how the plants have been totally hoodwinked by the super flaring sun into a false sense of horticultural security. Or is it that the plants have bamboozled the sleeping sun for their own ends of incessant growth? Hmm, something unsavory going on in this star system, says the human. Anyway, be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.